In June 2020, Kurt Cobain's Martin D-18E was sold for $5 million through Julian's Auctions. After buyer's premium and auction fees, the grand total came out to $6 million. That price tag officially made it the most expensive guitar ever sold, beating out the previous world record of $3.59 million for David Gilmour's Black Strat in 2019. Basically anything Kurt touched goes for museum level prices, but why did this odd acoustic in particular reach that astronomical price? That's because it's the sole guitar Kurt used on November 18th, 1993 for Nirvana's monumental episode of MTV Unplugged. Unplugged is a television series by MTV that showcases artists playing stripped down versions of their music with acoustic instruments and has been airing since 1989. On paper, Nirvana should just be another episode in the series, but it is much more than that. Their full set was released as a live album on November 1st, 1994, seven months after Kurt's death and just about a year after the episode was recorded. It is widely regarded as one of the greatest live albums of all time. Most Unplugged episodes features bands rocking their hits as if they're at Madison Square Garden with acoustic guitars, but Nirvana's set is completely different. Other than Come As You Are, there are no hit songs, and of the 14 songs played, six of them are covers. Their set is a brilliant showcase of who Kurt Cobain was as a writer and performer. In the eye of the general public, he was looked at as just another angry, screaming grunge rocker, and he had expressed wanting to be more than just that. It might be nice to eventually start playing acoustic guitars and be thought of as, as um a singer and a songwriter rather than a grunge rocker, you know? Because then I might be able to take advantage of that when I'm older and, and sit down on a chair and play acoustic guitar like like a, like Johnny Cash or something, you know? And, and it won't be a big joke, but who knows? This performance did just that and cemented his rightful reputation as one of the greatest singer-songwriters of all time. Nirvana's Unplugged set is intense, awkward, beautiful, haunting, loose, and transcendent, all at the same time. This has always been one of my favorite Nirvana shows. I have a huge sentimental attachment to it. When I first discovered Nirvana as a 14-year-old, I was completely mesmerized by Unplugged. It defined the word acoustic for me. When I heard that word, I would think of this album before thinking of acoustic guitars. When my band played acoustic shows, we always sat down because that's how Nirvana did it. It was never a question. I religiously made my parents and brother watch it with me every February 20th for years growing up. Sorry guys. It's really hard to put into words the impact that these 54 minutes of music has had on me. I always dreamed of having some sort of version of Kurt's unplugged guitar, but that dream was shattered upon the very first time I googled to see what Martin D18Es go for. In the back of my mind though, I always wondered if you could just take a normal acoustic and mutilate it to D18E specs, but I never pursued the idea seriously. In May of 2022, my life changed when my YouTube channel got some momentum and started getting a small following. Right away, the most requested thing I got was unplugged tone videos. If you know me, then you know that when it comes to Nirvana guitars, I need to get as close to the original as possible. Simply taping a pickup in a random acoustic wasn't going to cut it for me. There was no way I could ignore all the unplugged requests. It was then that for the first time in my 15 years of playing guitar that I sat down and seriously looked into what it would take to mod a guitar to Kurt's D18E specs. In this video, we will go over the history, specs, and legacy of Kurt's Martin D18E and what I had done to my Sigma to replicate it as close as I can. If you completely take away the association with Nirvana, the Martin D18E is still an incredibly rare and valuable guitar on its own. It was only produced for one year, 1958 to 1959, and was one of Martin's first attempts at making an electric acoustic guitar. They essentially took their iconic D18 model and stuck two D'Armond Rowe Dynasonic pickups in it with an overall volume knob and a tone knob for each pickup. 
The late 50s folk demographic that Martin was trying to sell this to saw this as blasphemous and it was not received well. Only 302 total were ever made. How did an oddball reject acoustic become what is arguably one of the most iconic guitars of all time? Our story starts when Kurt Cobain bought his in the fall of 1993 at Voltage Guitars in Los Angeles for $5,000. That is the equivalent to $10,661 in 2023. The serial number on his is 166854. It is number 7 of 302. The following is a quote from Kurt's guitar tech Ernie Bailey from the March 1995 issue of Guitar World. I don't believe he had any idea how rare it was before he bought it. Kurt was neither a collector nor a connoisseur of rare guitars. I think he saw the D18E as an oddity, hoping it would sound as good as it looked. It needed some work done right off the bat. This is a photo of it at Ernie Bailey's shop before it went through the lefty conversion. Voltage recut the existing nut so it could be played left-handed. It also had the bridge filled in and a new slot routed for the bone piece. The first time we see Kurt with it is on September 8, 1993 at the Rock Against Rape Benefit in Hollywood. There is great quality soundboard audio of this, and in the beginning we can hear what sounds like the pier signal of the guitar. From pictures, we can see that he was using the neck pickup. And funny enough, it looks like he's also wearing the same Frightwig shirt that he'd wear two months later at Unplugged. At the time of recording this video in March 2023, the guitar is currently on display at Unpopular, an exhibit put on by Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, Australia. This previously unseen picture is a part of that exhibit and could potentially be the first picture we have of Kurt with this guitar. It was taken in 1993 in Los Angeles, and we can see that Kurt has a band-aid on his forehead just like he did at the September 8th show. So either one of these could be the first documentation we have of Kurt using his Martin. At this point, it's unclear which photos took place first. After that, the next time we see it is on the In Utero Tour. Based off the surfaced pictures and videos that we currently have, October 25th at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago is the first time we can see it on this tour. The only other acoustic guitar he used on this tour was his Epiphone Texan with the Nixon Now sticker. The next day, October 26th in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we see some amazing soundcheck pictures that feature the Martin. We can see that Kurt is still using the neck pickup and that he has now added tape to the volume knob, presumably to stop from accidentally lowering the volume with his arm since he'd be playing the guitar upside down. At some point in November, a huge change was made to the Martin. A Bardellini 3AV sound hole pickup was installed. This was put in because Kurt was unhappy with how the DeArmond pickups sounded. Ernie has said that these pickups were designed with nickel strings in mind, so hearing them with bronze wound strings was pretty disappointing. Kurt chose the 3AV because he had seen Peter Buck of REM use it and he really liked the sound. He already had this pickup in his Epiphone Texan, but on the Martin, the clear brackets had to be cut to accommodate the neck pickup. Kurt's 3AV was wired directly to the output jack, which means everything else on the guitar was bypassed and no longer in use. The 3AV had no tone or volume control. You plugged it in and you just heard 100% of that pickup at full capacity. We can see here on November 10th, that the tape on the volume knob is gone and the pickup selector is now set to what would have been both pickups instead of just the neck like Kurt had previously been using. This is the only clear picture we have of it from that show and unfortunately it's really hard to confirm if the Bardellini is there. But based on the pickup selector and the missing tape, I think it's a safe bet that it is there. The next time we see it is eight days later, on November 18th at Sony Music Studios in New York for the unplugged taping. This was Kurt's setup for that historic show. The Martin D18E, Electroharmonic Small Clone that was used on Come As You Are, Boss DS2 that was used on The Man Who Sold The World, 
and his Fender Twin Reverb. During rehearsals, he tried using his polychorus, but it was causing a noisy hum, so it was ultimately switched out for the small clone. Here's a very interesting quote from the March 1995 Guitar World article. Although he is known for the punkish nonchalance of his guitar approach, the rehearsal tape shows that Cobain can be quite obsessive about tone and guitar equipment. He enters into a lengthy debate with one technician over the various qualities of his two electroharmonics pedals. Later, he asks about the feasibility of acquiring replacement machine heads for his Martin. These aren't good machine heads, he sadly observes. At the time of recording Unplugged, the Martin had Grover tuners. The show's producers were less than thrilled about him being plugged into an amp and using effects for what was supposed to be a completely unplugged set. But Kurt insisted on using this setup. Ernie has said in interviews, The D18E was more of an electric guitar than it was acoustic. We were walking on thin ice with Unplugged. When they saw that we were using an acoustic guitar with electric guitar pickups, through several electric guitar pedals and into an electric guitar amp. To keep the twin reverb as clean as possible, the 7025 preamp tubes were replaced with 12 AX7s, and the 12 AT7 phase inverter was replaced with a 12 AU7. Unplugged producer Alex Coletti made a box in front of the amp to make it look like a monitor to keep up the unplugged illusion. The amp was mic'd up with a Sennheiser 409, while an AKG 460 was placed discreetly in front of the Martin to capture its natural acoustic sound. The guitar was also run through a Countryman T85 direct box, and Kurt's vocal mic was a Bayer Dynamic 480. So this is Kurt Cobain's complete and total audio setup for MTV Unplugged. Kurt used his usual orange Dunlop Tortex guitar picks, and from the auction photos we can see that he used Martin Phosphor Bronze strings. From the three packets we can see, it seems like he used medium gauge, 13 to 56. Kurt used finger ease on the fretboard of the Martin to smooth out the solo in About a Girl. He joked about it, saying, you know that goofy ass stuff? It's like anal gel. He said that he had never used fretboard lubricant before, but that his country and western aunt used to. We can also hear the meat puppets joking about the finger ease in the rehearsal footage. I was addicted to finger ease for a long time. It was suggested to Kurt that he use the Texan for the show. It's been said by those who were in his orbit that it sounded significantly better than the Martin, but Kurt was certain about wanting to use the D18E. I couldn't find any info regarding why he made this decision, but I speculate that he wanted to make a statement by using a guitar that looked so weird and out of the ordinary. It was also probably to poke at MTV, who tried to be strict about unplugged episodes actually being 100% unplugged. For a guy who wore a handmade Corporate Magazine's Still Suck shirt on his band's first Rolling Stone cover story, using a half-robot looking acoustic with three pickups and three knobs on the show that was supposed to be unplugged definitely fit his aesthetic. It is not a discreet instrument by any means. Interestingly, the Texan was behind Kurt for the entire show. It is the only instrument that is not used but is on stage the entire time. It was not put there as a backup, but it was there in typical Cobain humor, having a large Richard Nixon bumper sticker on display in the midst of all the elegant flowers and candles. After the now legendary finale of Where Did You Sleep Last Night, Kurt jokingly pretends that he's about to smash his guitar, but then sets it gently on a stand and walks off stage, unknowingly to him having just made music history. MTV producers begged for an encore, and everyone in the band was on board except for Kurt. The producers pushed Kurt for five minutes for just one more song, and Kurt finally said, I can't top that last song. And at that, MTV dropped the pressure, and the unplugged taping was complete. Eight days later, on November 26th, the In Utero Tour rolled on. With the photos and videos that are currently available, we know that he used the Martin at at least 10 more shows after Unplugged. At some point in December, Goto tuners were put in to replace the Grovers that Kurt was unhappy with. 
One notable instance of the Martin being used in this time period is the New Year's Eve show in Oakland, California. Kurt stops the song and tosses this guitar to the side to call out a guy who is groping a woman in the audience. With the footage that's available, the last time we see Kurt playing this guitar is on February 27, 1994, in Ljubljana, Slovenia. That is Nirvana's second to last show. The final show was two days later, on March 1st, in Munich, Germany. We know that Polly was played at this show, but we currently don't have any photos or videos to confirm if it was played on the Martin or the Epiphone. Hopefully one day footage will surface so we can determine what was the last acoustic guitar that Kurt Cobain played on stage. This is my replica of this extremely historic guitar. It is a highly modified Sigma DM3. Just as Epiphone is to Gibson or Squire is to Fender, Sigma is to Martin. It is a brand that was originally released by Martin in 1970, with the goal of making more affordable versions of higher-end Martin guitars. Sigma is still around today, but is no longer owned and ran by Martin. They retained control from 1970 to 2007. There are various Sigma DM models, ranging from DM1 to DM18. I went with the DM3 for two reasons. One, other than the pickguard, I felt like it visually looked very close to the Martin D18. And two, honestly because they are pretty cheap and easy to find. The ultimate build would be to get a Martin D18 and mod it. But I don't have the heart or the pockets to drop that kind of money on an extremely nice high-end acoustic guitar just to have it gutted and mutilated. In the back of my mind, there was always a chance that this wouldn't work or would sound terrible in the end. So a Sigma was a safe and affordable lab rat for this crazy experiment. Reading about Sigmas online, I saw a lot of people saying that these 80 Sigmas were little known gems that actually sound really great. After putting a new set of strings on mine, I completely agreed. It had a very rich, full tone with a surprising amount of low end. I started looking into Sigmas and all the parts needed in July of 2022 and did not have the finished guitar in my hands until March 2023. It took that long because some of the parts were nearly impossible to find. Some turned out to actually be impossible to find so I had to use the next best thing. I will go over all the parts I bought in the order of how easy it was to find. The easiest parts, strings and bridge pins. I am using the modern version of the strings Kurt had, medium Martin Phosphor Bronze, and regular black acoustic pins. Both are quick to find on Amazon. Next would be the two DeArmin Row Dynasonic pickups. The pickups themselves are relatively easy to find. I got both of mine on eBay, but what is difficult is the pickup casing. The D18Es had a specific, slightly slanted trapezoid style casing that looked like this. You can occasionally find one of these vintage pickups on Reverb, but it comes with a vintage price. I wasn't prepared to drop a thousand dollars alone on just these pickups. I looked extensively into trying to find custom casings for the modern pickups, but ultimately found nothing. It was really important to me to not have look-alike copy pickups, but actual DeArmin Dynasonics. I was discouraged for a while until I saw pictures of other people's builds where they don't have the exact casing and I thought those guitars still looked really damn good. 
I got the normal looking modern version of the Diarmin Road Dynasonic pickups on eBay and decided that this was just one aspect of the guitar I would not be able to replicate. Now we are getting into the very difficult category. First, the knobs. Again, the D18E had very specific looking knobs. I could not find any close looking recreations of it and I could not find any examples of someone ever selling the vintage knobs on their own. The knob search drove me crazy. I would search on eBay and Reverb for every variation of cream guitar knob and literally go through every single page looking for the closest match. I finally found one I thought could look the part on lovemyswitches.com. I got three mission control knobs, which I think was pretty new at the time. They are bigger than the actual D18E knobs, but after looking through hundreds of listings for weeks, in my opinion, these are the closest looking knobs I could find. For the black ring under them, I just went to a local hardware store and bought three black washers. A few days after posting about my guitar, I got a lead via an Instagram message for more accurate looking knobs. I am currently waiting on those to arrive, and I will do a follow up where I show those knobs once I have them. And lastly, arguably the most important piece for Kurt's unplugged tone is also the most difficult to find, the Bardellini sound hole pickup. This pickup is the reason why this build took so long. I looked daily for half a year before I finally found one. Weirdly enough, I have some stories from that six month time period about my adventures of trying to find it. I found two leads that ended up going nowhere. If there's any interest in hearing those gear hunting stories, let me know and I'll share them in a separate video. What I have is the Bardellini 3A, which is technically a different model than Kurt's Bardellini 3AV. When the listing for this pickup popped up, I jumped on it so fast that I didn't even do any research until after buying it. I saw it was a Bardellini, and I saw it had the clear brackets, and I just didn't hesitate. Turns out the 3A and the 3AV are extremely similar and basically have the same tonal characteristics. The 3A is a quiet single coil, while the 3AV is a stacked single coil. The stacked single is a second dummy coil wired underneath the original single coil to cancel out single coil hum, so it's basically like a vertical humbucker. The second coil does change the sound, usually reducing the high end. So the conclusion I came to is that they would both have the same tonal character, just different EQ. The difference being that the 3A is brighter than the 3AV. I'm happy that it's this way and not the other way around. I would rather have to tone down brightness than to try to add high end that isn't there. I was initially worried, since it's technically a different model, that it wouldn't get me the unplugged sound, but I'm very happy to say that it completely does. So if you're looking to recreate this iconic tone, the Bardellini 3A or 3AV will get you there. The only downside is just like this 90s Bardellini catalog lists, the 3A is very quiet. It has a very low output, so you do have to crank the volume or gain to get a decent level. It hasn't been a problem for me though. Once I give it enough volume, it sounds amazing, and I get the warm fuzzies inside when I strum and I hear that iconic unplugged tone that's been influencing me since I was a teenager. When it comes to this important pickup, I need to give a big shout out to my friend JQ. He has a 3AV, and I told him about how I was having such a hard time finding one for myself and he was actually the one who messaged me the listing for the 3A that I ended up getting. After I bought it, I was like, wait a second, what's the difference between the 3A and the 3AV? Do you know? We started trying to figure it out, and he was the one who found this section of a 90s Bardellini catalog that explains it. A big thank you to him for sending me this listing. This pickup was such a pain to find. Hey everyone, this is Eric from the future interrupting the video really quick. At the point when I'm recording this clip right now, the video you're currently watching is 100% done. It's fully edited, it's ready to be uploaded, but something just happened that I have to show you. So five days after first posting about this guitar and uploading my first cover with it, my friend sent me this. A local marketplace listing for a Yamaha acoustic with a vintage Bardellini sound hole pickup with the clear brackets. The listing didn't specify if it was a 3A or a 3AV, but I didn't take any chances. I bought it instantly, went and I picked it up, took it apart, and it's a 3AV. 
So if you would have told me while I was pulling my hair out trying to find one of these that I would end up with two, I would tell you to shut up and say that that would never happen. But here I am with two vintage Bartolini soundhole pickups. So I just swapped them out. So here's what I currently have in the guitar. I have the three AV, but it still has the three A brackets because those brackets were custom cut for my sound hole. And what I have here is my three A with the three AV brackets because they're full. I just swapped this out. So I haven't had a chance yet to record any sound demos with the three AV in it. What you've been hearing in this video in the background the entire time is this guitar, but with this pickup, the Bartolini three A. But now that I have the three AV in, I'll be recording a full sound demo soon of how the three AV sounds and how the two D Armin Rowe pickups sound. And now that I have both of them, I'm also gonna be doing a comparison video of the 3AV versus the 3A so we can hear the sound difference. And I'll also be doing a full unplugged tone video with the 3AV playing all the songs on the album and showing my settings for it. Because now this guitar is 100% Kurt Specs. 3AV, 2D Armin Rose. I'm really excited and happy. Thanks for making it to this point in the video. I know this is a long one, so I really appreciate you sticking it out. And I'll just shut up now and let you get back to the original video. Thanks. So I took all these parts and I mailed them to a good friend of mine who did the install and setup work. They have asked to remain anonymous because this was a one-time thing and I'm going to respect that. I don't have one-tenth of the experience or confidence to undertake a big mod project like this. So there was no way I was going to attempt this by myself. In addition to installing all the parts, they also made a custom pickguard, made custom pickup rings for the DRMins, put in the fret dots on the bridge, and picked out the best switch and pots for this build. They even went above and beyond by doing a fret level and putting in a new bone nut and saddle. There really aren't any words able to express how thankful I am for all the work they put into making this guitar absolutely perfect. Huge shout out to them. You know who you are. You literally made a guitar dream of mine come true. Unlike Kurt, I wanted to have the option to use the Dynasonics. All three of the pickups are wired. There is a three-way pickup selector that affects the Dynasonics. The first knob is the volume for the Dynasonics. The second is for the volume of the Bartolini. And the third is overall tone. I love having the ability to blend in the pickups together to varying degrees. There is a lot of tonal possibilities with this funky guitar. Thank you for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed learning all about Kurtz Martin and my tribute build of it. This guitar and its tone on Unplugged completely shaped how I looked at acoustic guitars and was super influential to me. I have so many memories tied to hearing this guitar playing those songs. This video and this build is a love letter to my favorite acoustic guitar tone of all time.